So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writings, where we're looking at Christiana Rosetta's poem, Goblin Market. Uh, we have already had a series of lectures on this poem, so we'll just dive into the text and move on from where we left last time. So we, we had seen how the poem uh, projects a moral economy, which is very interestingly combined with the financial economy and the sexual economy that all merge together uh, in different disguises. And we have two protagonists chiefly in this poem. So you have two sisters, Laura and Lizzie, and we have very different responses to the goblin market as embodied by the two sisters. So uh, the first sister, Laura, uh, she falls prey to the goblin market. She gets seduced by the goblin market and she partakes of the goblin fruit. Uh, and a goblin fruit, of course, could be a symbol of many things, several things. We talked about how it could be a symbol of, uh, it could be an allegory about contaminated consumption. Uh, it could be a symbol of addiction. It could be a symbol of an outlandish commodity, which is dangerous in its potential. Uh, and, you know, this constant refrain, this constant reference to the outsider, the constant reference to the fact that the goblin fruits come from the outside, is something that the poem um, you know, projects quite interestingly. And uh, contrasting the outside, of course, is a homely space of the, of the two sisters' intimate home, where they share their uh, very idyllic lifestyles together by you know, fetching honey, churning butter, making milk, uh, and then doing all kinds of household activities, which are very idyllic feminine activity. So that idyllic feminine activity space is corrupted um, and invaded, in a way, by the arrival of the goblin men. And we talked about already how the goblin men, they have very interesting physiognomy features in terms of making them look like animals uh, and they're half human, half animals, which is of course part of the uh, alterity package as it were. You know, the fact that they're outsiders, the fact that they are the others of this idyllic uh, homely landscape is, uh, is uh, that keeps coming up in this poem. Now, uh, we, we saw last time how there are certain verbs in the poem which are interesting, linger for instance, or loiter for instance, I mean linger, loiter, uh, these are verbs which suggest uh, a degree of ambivalence, a degree of directionlessness. So when the poem says, when a speaker tells us that Laura is lingering in the um, high glens, uh, lingering near the marketplace, or Laura is um, loitering in the high glens, unable to come back home, we get a sense of uh, not just ambivalence, but a sense of uh, you know, directionlessness, which is, of course, coupled with inertia uh, and a decadence that will come in. So this is the beginning of the degeneration of Laura where she doesn't quite have a sense of purpose in life, where she doesn't quite have a sense of spatio-temporal knowledge. And she's loitering aimlessly uh, in a goblin's glen. Uh, and as opposed to that, we have Lizzie, uh, who of course is very purposeful, who of course knows exactly what she wants. And she uh, is projected in this, in this particular poem as a virtuous woman, as a woman with a purpose, uh, a woman with integrity, uh, who keeps resisting the seduction of the goblin men and who walks into the goblin market. Uh, you know, with a sense of uh, to, to retrieve what uh, her sister has lost, right? And that's something that the poem will talk about uh, in this section. So, with that background in mind, let's dive into the poem and move on from where we left last time. And said the hour was early still, the dew not fallen, the wind not chill, listening ever but not catching the customary cry, come by, come by. What is iterated jingle of sugar baited words? Not for our all watching, once discerning, even once goblin, racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling, let alone the herds that used to tramp along the glen in groups of single of brisk fruit merchant men. So we had already done the stanza, and the reason why I'm repeating it is because if you look at the verbs uh, in this particular section, racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling, these are very animal metaphors, movement metaphors used by or attributed to animals uh, more generally. And of course, the herds, uh, the tramp along the gold, along the glen. So herd is, of course, a metaphor of an animal pack. Uh, and the whole idea of tramping along the glen is also uh, very, very, uh, you know, it has a degree of menace about it. Uh, so these are trams, these are half animals, half humans, the goblins, the goblin merchants, and they are a menace uh, to the idea of the countryside of the English uh, landscape, which is embodied uh, virtuously by the two sisters. Okay. Uh, and then till Lizzie urged, O oh, Laura, come, I hear the fruit call, but I dare not look. You should not loiter longer at its brook. Again, the word loiter is interesting. Loiter has a sense of aimlessness. Uh, so Laura is um, loitering along the brook, uh, hoping to get a glimpse of the goblin men. And the Lizzie, uh, the warning voice in the poem, she tells him, uh, her that you should, you should not, you know, uh, I hear the fruit call, but I dare not look. So I should not look towards that direction. 
I can hear the calls, I can hear the calls of the merchant men, uh, the seductive call to come and buy the sugar baited words. And we talked about already how this poem can be seen as an allegory uh, of the emergence of the advertisement industry in Britain at that point of time and the deceptive quality of advertisement uh, language. Uh, the deceptive quality of advertisement, um, you know, sensations, how to sensationalize certain things which can be potentially dangerous. Uh, and this potentially dangerous deceptive quality in the poem is something which keeps coming up and that's very interestingly mapped onto uh, the emergence of contemporary advertisement industry in Britain at that point of time. So in that sense, the poem is very topical for us today. The whole idea of consuming something which is contaminated but sensationalized. The whole idea of consuming something which is grown in very inorganic, artificial, unnatural ways. We had references already to places where there's always summer, where it's always fertile. And that, of course, sense, gives a sense of pathological fertility or unnatural or perverse fertility or perverse um, you know, abundance where there's always abundance and there's nothing which um, there's no uh, cyclicity of seasons at all. There's always summer, always fertile, always warm, always uh, fecund. Uh, and that idea of permanent uh, fertility or permanent abundance is of course what makes it um, uh, pathological in quality. So among other things, the poem can also be read as uh, consuming things which are um, you know, grown inorganically, grown dangerously. And again, that connects uh, this poem very interestingly to uh, some of the concerns we have today in our times. Okay, so you should not loiter longer at this brook. Come with me home. The stars rise, the moon bends her arc, each glowworm wings her spark. Let us get home before the night grows dark, for clouds may gather, though this is summer weather. Put out the lights and drench us through. Then if we lost her way, what should we do? So, you know, this is a warning voice of Lizzie, uh, the wiser sister who tells this, uh, you know, more vulnerable sister to get back home. And again, this constant juxtaposition of the homely space and the unhomely space or the uncanny space is something which the poem does very well. So the uh, spatial metaphors in the poem is interestingly mapped onto or mappable onto the psychological metaphors. So the home is a place where one is protected, uh, when one is intimate, when one is safe. Uh, as opposed to which we have the market which is the unhomely space or the um, you know the uncanny space where there's no protection there's always this danger of sensation a danger of contaminated consumption uh, and that danger is something which can pervade the home space as well that can affect you psychologically to the extent that it makes you uh, crack up as it does with uh, Laura. Laura turned cold as stone to find a sister heard the, sh the cry alone that goblin cry come by our fruits come by must she then buy no more such dainty fruit? Must she no more such succors pasture fine, gone deaf and blind? Her tree of life drooped from the root. She said not one word in a heart so ache. But peering through the dimness, not discerning, trudged home, her pitcher dripping all the way. So, you know, this, these are very, very symbolic uh, descriptions. So the whole idea of her pitcher dripping all the way uh, could be seen as a, you know, a symbol of a lifeblood, <coughs> excuse me, our lifeblood uh, in a draining of, outside of her, draining out of her, uh, the picture dripping all the way can be seen very symbolically as, as that kind of a, um, example of decadence or innovation uh, or emptying out or liquidation of a lifeblood. Um, and the whole idea of trudging uh, is, of course, trudging is a laborious walk. So when you trudge, you walk very laboriously, you walk very effortfully. Uh, so each step becomes heavier than the previous one and that becomes an act of labor. Uh, <clears throat> So, you know, there are clear indications, are clear signs that, that Laura is beginning to show signs of decadence, are beginning to show signs of emptying out, uh, and the goblin fruit that she had consumed is, is beginning to make its presence felt in her system uh, in terms of draining her out of her lifeblood, in terms of you know, liquidating her, as it were, and in terms of, you know, biologically affecting her in a very adverse way. So she said not one word in a heart so ache, but peering through the dimness, not discerning, uh, trudged home her pitcher dripping all the way. So crept to bed and lay silent till Lizzie slept, then sat up in a passionate yearning and gnashed her teeth for bulk desire and wept as if her heart would break. So this whole idea of being addicted uh, to something is very clearly indicated away here. So she gets up in the night, she's unable to sleep and she gets up and you know she has a passionate yearning for the fruit and gnashed her teeth uh, for bulk desire. So very, very uh, common signs of addic uh, you know, people who become addicted uh, to certain uh, substance, certain uh, kinds of forbidden or dangerous substance <clears throat> where that uh, affects your body to such an extent that you keep yearning for it, you keep yearning for that drug. Uh, and again, among the other things th that this poem uh, may be read as, this could also be read as a warning against addiction. 
uh, drug addiction or you know dangerous substance addiction. Uh, so Laura over here has obviously consumed something which is dangerous, uh, and that dangerous commodity is affecting her system to the extent that she can't sleep at night. And she gets up in the middle of the night, and then she gnashes her teeth and passionate desire for that. But of course, she can't find it, uh, and then she weeps as if her heart would break. So it's you know she is biologically and metabolically uh, completely uh, you know caving in uh, to the idea of uh, to the experience of consuming um, that that particular forbidden fruit. And then we have a more long drawn out description of what happens to her, uh, you know, so in terms of uh, the biological effect that the, the forbidden fruit had on her system. Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain, in sullen silence of exceeding pain. She never caught again the goblin cry, come by, come by. She never spied the goblin men, hawking the fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and grey, she had dwindled as a fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. So what began with the very symbolic description of the pitcher dripping all the way now gets a more embodied uh, experience. So it becomes a more spectacularly evident um, uh, experience. So you know we are told quite clearly that you know her hair grows thin and grey which is obviously an indicator uh, an indicator of premature aging. Uh, she dwindles, she's shrinking uh, in bodily and a, and a fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn. So her life blood or life system, her life tree is compared to a moon uh, which we are told uh, is decaying away very, very swiftly and you know, it turns into something lifeless in quality very, very soon to swift decay and burn her fire away. So her life fire is burning away, her life blood is um, dripping away, etc. So we have all these very, very uh, uh, consistent images of decadence and degeneration and uh, imminent death as it were and that's something that uh, Laura is experiencing. <clears throat> One day remembering her kernel stone she set it by a wall the face is out, dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot, but there came none, it never saw the sun, it never felt the trickling moisture run, while with sunk eyes and faded mouth she dreamed of melons as a traveller sees, false waves and desert drought, with shades of uh, with shade of leaf crowned trees, and burns a thirsty in a sandful breeze. So this final image of uh, a mirage in a desert, as it were, which is a false image of hope, a false image of optimism, uh, a deceptive image of optimism, is something which is you know mapped onto the uh, goblin fruit. Uh, so the goblin fruit is a false hope. The goblin fruit is an image, of, an example of uh, a deceptive uh, you know, optimism, deceptive happiness, which gives you a temporary happiness, but then takes away your life blood and then that doesn't really add any substance to you uh, biologically or existentially. Uh, all contrary, it takes away uh, you know, substance from you, it makes you more death-like, it makes you more you know, driven towards death. And this whole idea of uh, setting up a stone and then you know, hoping for a shoot to come out of it, hoping for moisture to come out of it, you know, that doesn't happen. And we've seen before how, th with the example of the figure called Jenny, uh, you know, Jenny, uh, where she's buried, we're told, no uh, flowers have been born in that particular spot. Uh, she's so perfectly dead. Uh, she's buried in snow uh, to the extent that you know, no, f no fruit and no flower have emerged around that region. So you know, that is an example of uh, absolute annihilation. And something similar is about to happen to Laura, we are told, uh, that you know, she's dreaming of melons, uh, but then these are false dreams. She's dreaming of forbidden fruits, those fruits that she had consumed, but then uh, that kind of dream is very similar to the dreams of uh, travelers in deserts uh, who hope to see, or who think to see uh, oasis, uh, who, who think to see uh, water bodies, but it turns out that they're false images. And that whole idea of deceptive uh, images or deceptive things is something which is constantly uh, you know, referred to in this poem. And again, that can be mapped onto very interestingly uh, to the whole idea of the deceptive and seductive uh, advertisement industry, which is controlled by men. So again, if we do a very uh, conventional gender reading of the poem, uh, would, the reading would suggest that the, the advertisement industry or the commodity industry uh, is controlled by the men uh, who are dangerous, who are deceptive, uh, who are completely unethical, unprincipled. And the consumers, the naive consumers in the poem, uh, especially the case of uh, Laura Oweya, is a woman who steps out of the house and consumes the commodity and in the process uh, she gets contaminated and in the process she gets completely uh, destroyed. You know, uh, her ideally feminine self gets destroyed. But obviously the poem uh, subverts this kind of a binary logic because then we have Lizzie who walks into the market uh, with a penny and then she recovers 
what a sister has lost, um, and that uh, becomes an example of an articulation of agency, a retrieval of agency as it were. Okay, so, she no more swept the house, tended the foals or cows, uh, fetched honey, kneaded cakes of wheat, brought water from the brook, but sat down listless in the chimney nook and would not eat. So all her normal biological uh, domestic activities are interrupted now. So we told, we, we gave a passage before where we taught, we, we told how she would go about uh, doing different kinds of duties um, and such as fetching honey, milking the cows, churning butter, uh, sowing, uh, but then that, all that ends and then we also told that she sat down listless. Again, listless would be uh, a sense of aimlessness, sense of directionlessness, she doesn't have a future to look forward to. And the chimney nook, uh, a very traditional image of decadence uh, sitting by the chimney nook, uh, listless, is a very Cinderella image, uh, you know, sitting by the cinders of the chimney uh, and then waiting for nothing to happen. Uh, so that becomes an example, an image of desperation, an image of, uh, you know, surrender, an image of complete listlessness, as it were. And she embodies that image uh, to a great extent and would not eat. So the whole idea of not eating, the whole idea of refusing to eat or body refusing to eat becomes a further uh, extension of uh, the death image that she has, the, the, fact that, the fact that she is moving towards death uh, and moving away from life, moving away from uh, substance uh, or sustenance and substance and moving towards annihilation and decadence and nothingness. And now we have the turn of the poem where Lizzie walks into the market and recovers uh, you know, what her sister has lost, recovers the female agency, the female sexuality, uh, you know, the female uh, you know, self to a certain extent. So tender Lizzie could not bear to watch her sister's cankerous care. So the fact that she, her sister is you know, waning away biologically is something which is, uh, you know, Lizzie could not bear anymore, yet not share. So Laura could not share what happened to her. Uh, at the same time, uh, she could do nothing about it. So Lizzie could not bear this image of Laura, uh, you know, dying away gradually without being able to share what happened to her. She night and morning caught the goblin's cry, come by orchard fruits, come by, come by. Beside the brook along the glen, she heard the tramp of goblin men, the yoke and stir. Poor Laura could not hear, longed to buy fruit to comfort her, but feared to pay uh, too dear. She thought of Jenny in the grave, who should have been a bride, but who for joys brides hoped to have, fell sick and died. In a gay prime, in earliest winter time, where the first glazing rhyme, where the first snowfall of crisp winter time. So again, we have very erotic images and the sense that maybe Jenny died out of a dangerous sexual disease. Uh, it's not spelled out, but then we're told that she, uh, you know, she gave in to the temptation perhaps, who for joys the brides hoped to have, which, you know, could be an allusion to different things. Uh, erotic activities, erotic experience, and maybe some other experience is not, not spelled out, but it's very clear that she went for the experience prematurely. Uh, as a result of which, she fell sick and died in a gay prime. In the prime of her life, she fell sick and died uh, because of her, you know, uh, giving in to the temptation of certain experience that she should not have given in at that point in time. And we're told earlier, and we're told again, uh, how her death is so complete that uh, no, no regeneration has happened at that particular point. So in earliest winter time, with the first glazing rhyme, with the first snowfall of crisp winter time. So winter traditionally is an image, the season of death in, in Britain, in colder countries generally, where you know, nothing grows, nothing is regenerated, and everything comes to a stand still. So winter becomes that kind of a time, the slow down time. Okay? Uh, and so we told that Lizzie uh, is thinking of uh, you know Jenny when you know how Jenny gave in to certain temptations and how she should not have, and uh, you know and then she's thinking about her own sister and how she's going through presumably the same kind of experience, uh, you know. And the image of Jenny is interesting because you know, like I said, it's a seemingly uninteresting character, but then despite being uninteresting, un unimportant rather, it's very very interesting uh, because she brings in a certain image of decadence, she brings in a certain image of temptation, a certain image of dangerous uh, consumption uh, that is used to throw light perhaps on, on Laura's condition, Laura's metabolic and biological condition. To Laura dwindling seemed knocking at death's door, then Lizzie weighed no more, better and worse, but put a silver penny in her purse, kissed Laura, crossed the heath with clumps of furs at twilight, halted by the brook, and for the first time in her life began to listen and look. So this again is a very symbolic act of putting a penny in her purse. 
So putting penny in a purse is putting the currency to purchase, uh, putting the instrument, the machine, the object, uh, the uh, instrument through which you can purchase and exchange and uh, establish uh, transactions in the marketplace. So she doesn't walk into the market only with a female sexual self that she will trade in, in for a commodity, but she walks in with a proper penny, uh, with a proper um, you know, instrument, a proper object, a proper um, object correlative of that kind of transaction. And that becomes uh, an example of resistance, that becomes an example of subversion in the poem. Uh, the beginning of the subversive movement. She put a silver penny in her purse. Uh, penny becomes a symbolic instrument of exchange which uh, undercuts uh, the whole idea of you know male exploiting uh, the female sexuality because she has a penny uh, to enter a proper transaction with the goblin men and that becomes of course as I mentioned that becomes an act of resistance over here. Uh, Kiss Laura cross the heath with clumps of furs at twilight halted by the brook and for the first time in her life, began to listen and look. So she's moving towards the goblin market. For the first time in her life, she's moving towards that direction, we are told. Laughed every goblin when, despite her peeping, came towards the hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing. So again, look at the verbs over here. Hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing, blowing. Uh, you know, none of these movements, none of these activities are human in quality, and they have a certain degree of menace about them. Uh, it's like bats flying in, it's like different kinds of animals uh, crawling and running and leaping in uh, with a sense of menace created around her. And that, that market becomes a market of menace, a market of dangers, dangerous possibilities, dangerous beginnings, as we have seen already established in the case of Laura. And there's a series of uh, other verbs which are suggestive of that kind of an animal metaphor, animal movements. Uh, chuckling, clapping, crowning, clucking and gobbling, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces pulling wry faces, demure grimaces, cat-like and rat-like, rattle and wombat-like, snail pace in a hurry, parrot voice and whistler, helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, chattering like magpies, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes, hocked her and kissed her, squeezed her and caressed her, stretched up the dishes, panniers and plates, look at her apples, russet and dumb, bob at her cherries, bite at her peaches, citrons and dates, grace for the asking, pears red for pears red for basking, wood basking, out in the sun, plums on the twigs, pluck them and suck them, pomegranates, figs. So if we take a look at the entire passage, we just get words thrown at us. Uh, they're not really fully formed sentences, and that's very, very indicative, that's very, very um, authentically uh, you know, representative of the advertisement slogans that we see even today. So if you look at advertisement slogans, we find they're oftentimes not full sentences. They have certain keywords which are thrown at us, uh, certain keywords which are meant to attract attention. So you have a list of different kinds of uh, fruits which are available in the market, and then uh, the whole seduction is to come and taste them, bite them, chew them, you know, suck them. And that's the whole idea of inviting the customer, inviting the uh, supposedly naive and innocent customer to partake of the food without even offering a price, without even listing a price, becomes the menacing quality of this market. <clears throat> and then even before that, we see uh, how the series of animal images, the animal attributes which are mapped onto the goblins, they're rat-like and cat-like. Uh, you know, they are hobbling and they are moving towards uh, the human customer in a very menacing fashion. Uh, and then they're hugging her and kissing her and squeezing her and caressing her. Uh, and, you know, these become activities which are often, uh, which are almost erotic in quality. So the goblin market becomes an, a market of uh, not just commodity transaction, uh, but also a certain degree of uh, erotic infection. So when the human uh, female walks into the market, she's surrounded by all these men. Uh, who begin to infect her, at least attempt to infect her erotically, sexually. Uh, you know, and this brings us back to the whole idea of Jenny and the whole idea, the whole uh, you know, indication or the fact that or suggestion that she may have uh, acquired a sexually transmitted disease uh, by being dangerous, by living a life dangerously, by giving into a temptation that she should not have given in before her marriage, as it were. So that idea of a sexually transmitted disease is very much pervasive in this particular section as well because when Lizzie walks from the market, she's surrounded by all these men who begin to touch her uh, and begin to squeeze her and caress her and then begin to seduce her with different kinds of objects, you know, outlandish fruits, you know, and, and they invite her to come and partake of the fruits in a very erotic fashion. So the whole idea of the erotic economy and the financial economy, the capitalist economy, are very interestingly and problematically merged under each other in this poem as we have seen already. Okay, uh, 
right. And then, of course, Liz's response is interesting because remember, she had walked in with a penny in her purse and she's not going to give in uh, and trade the uh, fruit and you know, trade her sexuality in exchange for fruit. She's going to pay for the fruit with a penny. And that idea of classifying the commodity with a penny uh, that undercuts the menace in the market because then that market becomes a classified market and that undercuts the, uh, the dangers and the seduction of the unknown market. So the moment you put a penny onto a commodity, the commodity becomes a classified commodity, the commodity becomes a non-dangerous commodity because you know it, it established, it is, it is moved into a grid of knowability. Right? So the penny has a price attached to it, so the commodity has a price attached to it, it's be it begins to have a name, it begins to have a price, it begins to have a classified identity, uh, which then makes it less dangerous in quality. So the whole idea of uh, putting a penny to a commodity and asking to pay for a commodity becomes a very symbolic act, which changes the economic structure in this particular market. It makes it into a, a buy and sell market with a proper classification, proper regulation. And that undercuts the unregulated quality, the unethical, the anarchic quality in the market that we have seen so far, which was very much tied onto or you know, into the erotic quality of the market in terms of making it completely uh, outlandish and unmanageable. Good folk, said Lizzie, mindful of Jenny, give me much and many, hell out of apron, toss them her penny, a very symbolic act, tossing them her penny. It's like I'm going to enter into this exchange, into this economy of exchange only with a penny, not with my sexuality, with my penny. So the penny becomes an instrument of protection as well as classification. It uh, becomes, uh, the whole idea of appropriating the penny becomes an appropriation of agency, an articulation of agency to an extent, uh, which undercuts, as I mentioned, uh, the masculinist menace in the market. Uh, the moment she's prepared to pay with a penny, um, that undercuts the whole idea of the anarchic market, which was gathering around to seduce her uh, and, and, and basically infect her uh, in different forms. Nay, take a seat with us, uh, honor and eat with us, they answered grinning. Our feast is but beginning, night yet is early, warm and dew pearly, wakeful and starry, such fruits as these no man can carry, half the bloom would fly. So they are not interested in the penny, they're trying to seduce her. Uh, into sitting with them and partaking uh, you know, the fruits and joining the feast uh, in the night. And so the whole idea of refusing the penny becomes an act of uh, refusing the articulation or rejecting the articulation of female agency, which Laura, uh, Lizzie is embodying by paying them with a penny. Right? So this becomes a bit of a contest. Okay, so sit down and feast with us, be welcome guests with us, uh, cheer you with the rest with us. Uh, thank you, said Lizzie, but one waits at home alone for me. So without further parlaying, if you will not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny. So the penny becomes a very symbolic uh, uh, instrument, a very symbolic object, which is hurled onto the goblin men uh, with the challenge of you know, giving them a certain kind of quantifiable commodity. Uh, so the moment you quantify the commodity, the moment the commodity becomes quantifiable with the penny, then it loses its uh, anarchic, dangerous, uh, you know, seductive possibility. And of course, the goblins are trying to reject. The goblins are, are trying to resist that kind of uh, classification. So they're not interested in the penny. They're actually interested in asking her to join in the feast. But Laura, of course, wants to quantify the commodity. Uh, Lizzie, of course, wants to quantify the commodity, wants to pay them with a the penny. Uh, in the process of paying them with a the penny, wants to undercut the anarchy of the marketplace. So the exchange of the coin, so uh, Lizzie trained them a coin and they are refusing the coin and they throw the, back, throw the coin back at her. It becomes a very, very symbolic act in the poem, uh, as you may uh, understand already. Uh, so if you not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny. I tossed you for a fee. So the whole idea of paying you for a fee becomes interesting because the moment I pay someone a fee, uh, I enter into an exchange, I enter into an understandable exchange of service, uh, you know, service providing and service, uh, you know, consumption. So I'm paying you a fee in, uh, in order to have a quantifiable uh, size, a quantifiable you know, consumption of your commodity. If you're not interested in that, give me back my penny. Right, so the fee becomes very symbolic, uh, you know, vehicle away. It becomes a vehicle of agency, it becomes a vehicle of uh, classification, it becomes a vehicle of quantification of the commodity, which, as I keep mentioning, undercuts the anarchy and the seductive quality of this marketplace. Uh, they began to scratch their pates, no longer wagging, purring, but visibly demurring, and that, that makes them angry, that makes them uh, cross, grunting and snarling. One called a proud, cross-grained, uncivil, the tones wax loud. 
the looks were evil. So it, this is a very typical uh, male response to a female with agency. So Lizzie walks in with agency. Lizzie walks in with the object of agency being the penny. Uh, and she refused to enter into a sexual exchange with the goblin men, as a result of which they called her the stereotypical descriptions, proud, uh, uncivil, cross-grained, etc. Because she's not giving and she's not being the demure, uh, you know, uh, yielding, uh, sexualized female. She is a female who walks in with agency. Uh, she's a female who possesses agency and that undercuts the entire masculinist uh, invasion of the female space over here. Right? And as a result of which they began to get cross, they began to call her names uh, and they began to uh, describe her in very, very uh, negative adjectives. Lashing their tails, so you know, the animal metaphors are now coming out, so almost like the claws are you know, showing, the claws and teeth are showing at the moment. Lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, it became, begins to become more, more violent, clawed with the nails, barking, mewing, hissing, uh, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. So this becomes uh, almost an example of sexual violence where they surround her and they begin to scratch her and tear away her hairs and then they force the fruit into her mouth. They surround her, they squeeze the fruits and force them into her mouth in order to make her eat. Uh, you know, and the whole idea of making her eat without paying for it uh, would, you know, continue that act of consumption, that would continue the act of male invasion on the female body and the female sexuality. The female is unable to pay and becomes an innocent and helpless uh, consumer uh, of this particular fruit. But of course, Lizzie had walked in with a penny and Lizzie is prepared to pay them a fee uh, for the consumption. So she's not really a gullible or passive or helpless consumer. She is an agentic consumer and that becomes the problem in this particular marketplace. So the attack on Lizzie over here is because of her agentic quality and she has been forced to lose her agency. Uh, she has been forced to eat the goblin fruit without paying for it. Uh, and if the, the entire idea of forcing her becomes quite sexual in quality. It becomes an act of sexual violence uh, to a certain extent. All the men surrounding her and attacking her body. Uh, you know, squeeze the fruits against the mouth to make her eat. White and gold and Lizzie stewed. So the colors, the traditional colors of virtue and um, integrity, white and golden and glory. Uh, white and golden Lizzie stewed like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue vein stone lashed by tides um, obstreperously, like a bacon left alone in a hoary roaring sea, sending up a golden fire like a fruit crowned orange tree, white with blossoms honey sweet, so beset by wasp and bee, like a royal virgin town topped with a glider dome and spire, close beleaguered by a fleet, Matt dug a standard down. So if you look at the descriptions over here, a series of positive, honorable, glorified descriptions. Um, uh, but at the end, what is really interesting, uh, there's a spatial description of a virgin town, a royal virgin town. And the word virgin over here obviously means many things. It can mean sexual virgin, it can, uh, which is indicative of uh, um, and Laura, Laura and Lizzie, especially Lizzie's uh, sexual quality at this point in time. She's a virgin against uh, these male invasions, um, the male sexual invasions which are happening around at that point in time. But also the town which is virgin, which is still pure, uncontaminated and toppled with gilded dome and spire and is beleaguered by a fleet, by a foreign fleet surrounding the particular town, mad to tug her standard down. So the, the particular fleet is mad to you know, bring down the town. Standard of course means a flag, the spire over here. And the, the beleaguered fleet, the enemy fleet, the foreign fleet around the town is attacking, is invading the town in a bit to tear the town down. So she resembles, uh, she resembles that kind of a town, uh, the town of uh, you know, integrity, glory, purity, virginity, which is being attacked by a foreign fleet, by attacked by a dangerous fleet around her. So again, the whole idea of insider, outsider, uh, dangerous attacker, dangerous invader, uh, and virtuous insider is constantly uh, played and projected in this poem. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink. So the whole fable of taking a horse to water but not making, uh, not in, you know, able to make him drink is something which you know, is suggested away here in terms of how Lizzie behaves. Though the goblin scuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her back as, uh, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her, Lizzie uttered not a word. So again, these are acts of violence uh, done to her body. 
So again, very symbolic. Uh, and the act of violence done to a body is, you know, is performed in order to make a cave in, in order to make a partake of the goblin fruit uh, as a non-customer, uh, as just a passive consumer. Because when she will consume, if she consumes the fruit as a passive consumer, as Laura had done, then she falls, she will fall a prey to the to, to the invasion of the goblin men. But she's still holding on to the penny, and she's refusing, uh, you know, to partake or eat or consume any of the forbidden fruit without having to pay for it, right? So that makes her a customer, an agentic customer in this particular marketplace, right? And that, of course, uh, is tied onto the idea of female agency in a very male mercantile space. Okay, Lizzie uttered not a word, uh, would not open lip from lip, lest they would cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syruped all her face and lodged in dimples of her chin and stricked her neck with which quake like curd. At last the evil people, worn out by resistance, uh, flung back a penny, kicked their fruit along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed to the ground, some died into the brook, would ring and ripple, some scudded on the gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. So the whole idea of violence which is very sexual in quality is indicated by different metaphors which uh, um, you know described away uh, you know, the whole idea of trying to push the squeeze fruit into her face uh, you know it's all very syrupy and curd like and then you know she keeps resisting that invasion she keeps resisting the sexual violence and at last the evil people worn out by her resistance uh, they fling back the penny at her and again this is very symbolic flinging back the penny at her makes uh, she repossesses a penny when it's given back to her uh, and that makes her, that retains her identity as an agentic um, customer, as an agentic client in a marketplace rather than a passive consumer. So she gets back the penny. Uh, again, the whole idea, the whole exchange of pennies is very, very um, uh, symbolic in quality and has a lot of symbolic significance, as I hope to have established already by the reading. So at the end, they kick the fruit and they, along, and they disappear in the distance. So along whichever road they took, and not leaving root or stone or shoot, uh, some writhed to the ground, some dived into the brook with rings and ripples, some scudded on a gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. So this is a very Pied Piper-like image where the rats disappear in the end. Uh, they dive into the sea, swim away, disappear, die. We're not quite know. Uh, we don't quite know, but then that, a similar kind of disappearance uh, happens over here in a very spectacular level. Uh, and the goblin men just, just, you know, merge away. They just disappear. They completely uh, blend away in a distance. So we don't quite know where they came from. We never knew where they came from. We don't know where they went. But the, the fact of the matter is they're gone from this idyllic uh, landscape. And then, of course, Lizzie emerges triumphant uh, out of this whole um, episode. In a smart ache tingle, Lizzie went her way, knew not, not it was night or day. So this refrain of knowing not it was night or day comes back. So if you go to the marketplace, you sort of lose your sense of embodiment. And you, if you walk back home uh, from the unhomely space, you walk back to the homely space, uh, you sort of lose your sense of night and day. You lose a sense of embodiment, your knowledge of embodiment, external embodiment around you. Sprang up the bank, tore through the first, treaded cops and dingle and heard her penny jingle bouncing in her purse. So again, a very symbolic um, description over here. She's hearing the penny jingle in her purse and that gives, uh, that's a reaffirmation of her agency. That's a reaffirmation of her agentic quality uh, and of course, by extension, a reaffirmation of a victory over these goblin men. Its bounce was music to her ear. She ran and ran as if she feared some goblin man docked her with gibe, uh, jibe or curse or something worse. So again, you know, she ran and ran, fearing that some goblin man would turn up and attack her with a jibe or a curse or something worse. And that's something worse. It could be sexual violence. Uh, it's not spelled out, but you have seen, already seen a series of metaphors of sexual violence that were done on the female body. So that kind of a suggestion is, of course, there. But not one goblin scurried after, uh, nor was she pricked by fear. The kind heart made a windy pace then urged her home quite out of breath with haste and inward laughter. So the inward laughter is one of a you know, victory, one of triumph. Uh, she goes back home with inward laughter. So the whole idea of going back home with laughter, the whole idea of going back home as victorious uh, is a very symbolic uh, you know, gesture, away, a very symbolic suggestion. She went to the marketplace, the unhomely space. She undercut the uncanny of the unhomely space. And now she's gone back home uh, with a sound of penny jingling in her purse. And that sound of penny jingling in the purse reminds her of a victory and she walks back home with an inward laughter, with a sense of triumph, with a sense of spiritual triumph, as it were. 
She cried, Laura, up the garden, did you miss me? Come and kiss me, never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices. Squeeze from the goblin, fruits for you. Goblin, pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me. Laura, makes much of me. For your sake, I have braved the glen and have to do with goblin merchant men. So there's almost a Christ-like quality about uh, Liz's figure where she comes back with a bruised body, uh, you know, almost like a nailed body of Christ after crucifixion. But that becomes a holy body, that becomes a body of redemption, the body of resurrection, as it were. Uh, so she walks back home with a bruised body and she invites Laura uh, to come and kiss her and get the juices out of her body as an antidote of a strange disease, the decadent disease that she has been experiencing. Uh, Laura started from a chair, flung her arms up in the air, clutched her hair. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted, for my sake, the fruit forbidden? Must your light, like me, be hidden? Uh, must your light, like me, like mine, be hidden? Uh, your young life, like mine, be wasted, undone in mine undoing, and ruin in my ruin. Thirsty, cankered, goblin ridden, she clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her, tears once again, refreshed and shrunken eyes, dropping like rain, after long, uh, sultry drought, shaking with aguish fear and pain, she kissed and kissed her with hungry mouth. So the whole idea of kissing her over and over again, it becomes almost an act of uh, healthy consumption, uh, consuming the antidote, as it were. Uh, and the whole idea of, uh, you know, she gets obviously scared by seeing um, uh, Lizzie walk in and she asks her the first impulse is, have you wasted your life in a way that I've wasted mine? Uh, have you wasted a young life, the, the prime of your life, the way I've wasted mine and for my sake, have you done away with your life? And then she walks in and sees Lizzie surrounded by the syrup around her body and then she kissed her and the process of kissing her over and over again, uh, she consumes the syrup which is presumably the antidote uh, to the disease that she has been suffering because of her consumption of the goblin fruit. Uh, she kissed and kissed her with a hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch, the juice has wormwood to her tongue. She loathed the feast, writhing as one possessed, she leaped and sung, rent all her robe and wrung, her hands in lamentable haste and beat her breast. Her locks streamed like the torch, borne by a racer at full speed, or like the mane of horses in the flight, or like an eagle when she stems the flight light straight towards the sun, or like a caged thing freed, or like a flying flag when armies run. So the series of violent metaphors of velocity uh, or a, is suggestive of a recovery. So she is recovering very, you know, uh, swiftly, but then that too is a violent process. The process of recovery is very violent. So we have all these metaphors of violence uh, and velocity you know, given to us in terms of describing how she is experiencing her recovery. Stood fire, uh, spread through her veins, knocked at her heart, met the fire smouldering there, and overbore its lesser flame. She gulged on bitterness without a name. Our fool to choose such part of soul consuming care. Sense failed in the mortal strife, like the watchtower of a town which, which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning stricken mass, like a wind uprooted tree spun about, like a foam topped water spout cast down headlong in the sea. She fell at last. Pleasure pass and anguish pass. Is it life or is it is it death or is it life? So you know this whole idea of consuming the syrup, consuming the juice from a sister's body, and then she doesn't know if it's life giving or life taking. That uh, brings us back to the idea of liminality uh, that a poem has been talking about for a long time. So the merge of life and death, the merge of home and unhome, the merge of uncanny and domesticity uh, constantly keeps running in the poem. And at this process, uh, when in this particular point where Lizzie walks in with the syrup and juices from the market uh, given to her by the goblin men by the attack done to her body, on her body by the goblin men, and she walks into home with that body, uh, it's almost like walking in with the menace of the market. But then that menace of the market is now domesticated inside the space of the home. And then uh, Laura consumes the syrup, consumes the juice, out of her sister's body, in the process of consuming it, uh, she begins to get uh, you know, a sense of recovery uh, and she begins to recover uh, her degeneration from her degeneration. She begins to recover from a sense of illness and uh, her gradual dying away. By this point, she's not quite clear whether it's life or death, and that's the liminality that the poem uh, sort of describes and keeps celebrating uh, throughout. Uh, and it keeps foregrounding through the different experiential conditions of the two female characters. Uh, okay. Life out of death, that night long, Lizzie watched by her, counted her pulses, a flagging star, felt for her breath, held water to her lips, and cooled her face with tears and fanning leaves. But when the first birds chirped about the caves, about the eaves, and early reapers plodded to the pace uh, of golden sheaves, 
the dew wet grass, bowed in the morning, went so brisk to pass, and new buds with new day opened uh, of cup like lilies in the stream. Laura awoke as from a dream. Laura awoke as from a dream, laughed in an innocent old way, hugged Lizzie, but not twice or twice. Her gleaming locks showed not one trail of grey. Her breath was sweet as May, and light danced in her eyes. So that night when she goes to sleep, uh, she's still in a liminal condition with life and death uh, because she is recovering from death and she still has a sense of death like quality about her. But then she goes to sleep, and then we are told when she wakes up in the morning, uh, she awoke as from a dream, and then there's not a single thread of grey hair on her head, and she's completely back to life, back to you know, vitality, back to youthfulness. And then her breath, we are told, is as sweet as May. May being the peak of summer, the peak of sweet summer in British conditions, and a light dance in her eyes. So, you know, that becomes an image of, uh, you know, lifelike quality. So, she has experienced regeneration. She's experienced redemption uh, from her fall, from being a fallen woman uh, who consumed the forbidden fruit. Uh, she has now, you know, been resurrected or redeemed uh, back into her life, back into her youthfulness, uh, thanks to the very Christless, Christ like quality of her sister Lizzie. And then we told the final paragraph, uh, the final stanza in the poem. Days, weeks, months, years, afterwards when both were wives with children of their own, the mother hearts beset with fears, uh, their lives bound up in tender lives, Laura would call the little ones, and uh, there's a sense of advice and warning and wisdom given uh, to them, and tell them of her early prime, those pleasant days long gone of not returning time. Uh, or would talk about the haunted glen, the wicked, quaint fruit merchant men, the fruits like honey to the throat but poison to the blood. So I'll stop at this point today, but then what's interesting at the end is that how that image of the goblin man comes back as a warning to the children, uh, and then we are told that they are wives, they are married, but they're not, there's no mention of the husbands. So the idea of the sisterhood uh, keeps continuing uh, in the poem, and they are told they're given, they, they impart the wisdom that experience as woman to the next generation of women, and how uh, they, they are warned against the next generation of women, they're warned against the evils of the goblin men. Uh, so the men as outsider invaders, and the women as sisters sort of sticking on together, uh, the sisterly solidarity that they have with each other, something which the poem establishes again in the end. And that's the bit which will need some unpacking, which will cover the next lecture. So I'll stop at this point today, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.